Okay, let's get started. Hi, everybody. My name is Izzy, and I go to Innovation Lab High School. Hi, everyone. My name is Kenna. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. Um, welcome to the uh, information session for my school, Innovation Lab. If you have a friend or family member who cannot make it to the webinar today, this will be posted on YouTube. Here to share more is our principal, Mr. Shuki. Thank you very much, Kenna, and thank you very much, Izzy. I appreciate the introduction. Welcome to our webinar this evening. We have a, a presentation set up tonight to tell you a bit more about Innovation Lab and about the kind of things that we have going on at the school. So without further ado, I am going to share my screen and take us into the presentation that we have set up for you tonight. Uh, one of the things that I would like to call attention to, <clears throat> if it will, come on, go into presentation mode, you can do it, there we go. We are using the Microsoft Translate app this evening to provide a translation if you would like to see the text of our spoken words in a translated language. The code is down here at the bottom of the screen, H-G-U-Y-R. Once again, the code for the Microsoft Translate app is all capitals, H-G-U-Y-R. If you would like to use that to have the, the spoken words we are saying translated into a written record in the language of your choice. And now moving onward, let's begin. First of all, I would like to introduce you to tell you a little bit about myself. Who am I? Well, I'm Peter Shirky. I'm the principal of Innovation Lab High School. I am a scientist. I'm also an author. I am a musician. I spent many years playing sousaphone in the Husky Marching Band and spent uh, several winter breaks uh, at bowl games down in Southern California. I'm an engineer. I'm an educator. I am a composer. I wish I could say with a straight face I was an artist, but my talents in that arena have never progressed past stick figures. But when I put all of it together, when I begin to bring these different aspects of who I am together in unique ways, I become something else entirely. I'm an innovator. And that's why I'm here to talk to you tonight about our school, Innovation Lab High School. So let's start off with why innovation. And it begins with what our schools, as they currently are, are constituted, what, what they were designed for. In 1893, a group of industrialists got together, called themselves the Committee of Ten. And they came up with an idea for what schools should be. The idea they came up with was to create people for this reason, factory line workers people who could do the same task over and over and over again without error. Not much thought involved, not much uh, room for creativity. You've got a job to do and we wanna train you to do it right every time. Problem is our world has changed. That's not what our world looks like anymore. Today, our world looks a lot more like this. Robots are, are replacing humans in, in so many of the jobs that are out there. And ultimately, we have the responsibility now to train our students for a whole new world of work, a whole new world out there where they want to be innovators in their own right so that they are coming up with potentially the jobs of the future. So oftentimes when people think of innovation, they think of iPhones, they think of Apple watches, they think of all sorts of really shiny high-tech innovations. And those are a form of innovation. But when you get down to the definition of what innovation is, it's the act of bringing new possibilities into existence. Another definition is very simply creative problem solving. And that is where 
we bring innovation down out of the lofty clouds of of technology and and envisioning that only some few like the Steve Jobs of the world can can be true innovators or the Elon Musks or or the the folks that are out there and doing the flashy glitzy stuff any of us can be creative problem solvers in fact innovation is not reserved for the few it is something we all need to embrace if we are to move forward every one of us has within us the power to be an innovator and what we want to do with our students is help them to recognize that bring that forward and become innovators themselves so we started innovation lab high school and as we were doing a lot of the thinking and the dreaming and the visioning for innovation lab high school we were consulting heavily the research of Dr. Tony Wagner, one of the world's foremost experts on innovation and innovators. Dr. Wagner was here in the district back in February of last year and did a, a special engagement here where he talked at the North Shore Performing Arts Center. Uh, and it was a fantastic evening. Uh, if any of you were lucky enough to have gone, uh, just a fantastic opportunity to hear a real expert talk about innovation. And according to Dr. Wagner's research, there, there's a thing that nearly every innovator that he interviewed, he interviewed several of the, the biggest innovators out there, talked to their parents, talked to their teachers. And what he found was in every case, their parents encouraged play. And that that childhood play led each of those innovators to an adolescent passion that they really dug their hands into and became that thing that they were, it was all encompassing for them. And that that adolescent passion then led them to an adulthood filled with a sense of purpose. And that it was the same time after time after time, play leads to passion, leads to purpose. It's for that reason that we are trying to bring a sense of play back into what we do at the school, trying to help our students find their passion and put them on the road to an adulthood where they are going to feel a sense of purpose in what they are doing. So a way that I like to think about what we are doing at Innovation Lab is thinking of in terms of a turning radius. Now, Think for a second about an aircraft carrier, okay? Aircraft carriers are amazing. They, they're, it's a floating city. They have thousands of people each doing their jobs in support of what the aircraft carrier's mission is. Um, you can land planes on an aircraft carrier. You can support rescue missions with helicopters and search and rescue. Um, it, it can project its, its will upon whatever is around it. A aircraft carrier is a great a uh, great metaphor for a comprehensive high school. They have a tendency to change everything else to meet the way they do things. And their turning radius is measured in miles. It takes incredible amounts of energy and time and distance to change a comprehensive high school. It it's not that, that the comprehensive high schools are bad. In fact, they are wonderful, wonderful educational institutions that have served so many of our students so well for so long, but they're not really responsive to change. On the other hand, I want you to picture Innovation Lab is something more like this, a speedboat. Smaller, more nimble, easier to turn, more responsive able to change directions as we come up with new information about how the things we are trying are working and if they're working really well make tweaks to try and help them work even better if it's not working abandon that thing that's not working and try something else but that agility comes at a bit of a cost we're not able to do the same number of things or the size of things that a comprehensive high school can do because we are so much smaller. Just like you would not try and, and uh, run the shoals in an aircraft carrier having to navigate between the rocks, 
you don't want to try and land an airplane on a speedboat. It just doesn't work. So there's a trade-off there. And we've made that intentional trade-off to create a smaller school that is more nimble and more responsive in the name of trying to help find ways to help our students realize their potential as future innovators. So one of the questions I frequently get is who is an Innovation Lab student? That's a great question because just about any student could be an Innovation Lab student. As, we, as I talked about a little bit ago, we have this, this philosophy that all of us need to embrace innovation if we're going to move forward as a society. But we happen to have a couple of our students with us tonight. And so I thought I would bring Kenna and Izzy back. I'm going to stop sharing my screen in a moment and introduce them and have them talk to you a little bit about their experience so far. Uh, Izzy is one of our ninth grade students here at Innovation Lab, and she is a founding member of our crew council. Kenna is a 10th grade student at Innovation Lab and is the team lead for one of our expedition groups. So with that, I am going to stop sharing my screen for a moment. And let's talk to Izzy and Kenna. Izzy, you're, you were first on the slide, so let's talk to you first. Tell us a little bit about your experience at Innovation Lab High School so far. Okay, so I'm in ninth grade at Innovation Lab High School, as he said, and I think it's very different from any school I've ever attended. Uh, for me personally, I like that it's a smaller school uh, you really get to know a lot of the people there and it's really helped like we can change things really fast if something's not working we can change it um, and we always give feedback in our, the classrooms and it's just been really great. Thank you Izzy. Kenna how about you tell us a little bit about your experience so far. Hello everyone. So um, I actually have had a really good experience at Innovation Lab. Um, so I, one of my favorite things is all the collaboration we do in groups, whether it's the expedition or if it's just in class. Um, I really like to work with other people, so I find it really fun. Um, but I love the, the new style of a classroom where it's talking about ideas and going over topics and more like focusing on discussion and um, focusing on these projects or these topics through projects. And it's not about going to class and filling in some worksheet and stealing the answers from your friends just so that you can get a good grade. Um, it's about really deep thinking through some of these cool topics. Um, and yeah, like I've just had a lot of fun in class. Um, I also feel like um, at Innovation Lab, I've had so many really cool opportunities. So I am part of Climate Action Club. And recently I was able to present to a third grade class about climate change. And all the students were just so excited to listen to me present. And I just, I felt so good about what I was doing. And I'm just so grateful for experiences like that. And also with the expedition I've been doing, um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, um, but uh, basically I had an idea for a prototype um, for a problem that we're working on for the expedition. And um, it was really cool because it was my idea and a bunch of people wanted to work on the idea that I had. And it was just really cool to work with a bunch of people so that was really fun, yeah. And um, I think lastly, my favorite thing about Innovation Lab is that I think we're already just such a close community and I feel accepted and um, it's just such a great community. And I love that the school is also somewhat small so we can really get to know each other. And when I go to a class, I'm just so happy to be in class and see people that I know and I know that I'll be supported and that I'm able to support everybody else. So it's just a really great community. And I think anybody who wants a different learning style and something a little bit more personalized should definitely come to Innovation Lab. Thank you, Thank you so much, Kenna. Now I just wanna 
go back and, and touch on something I think I heard you say. It is possible for, for you to actually be having fun at school and yeah. still be learning? I have so much fun at Innovation Lab, literally every single day. Even though we're online, it's been an awesome experience. Interesting. You hear that, students? School can be fun. It, it, is, it is a possibility. I'm going to go back to our, our slide deck and continue with the, uh, the presentation that we are, are going on here. So moving along, one of the things that, that Dr. Wagner also said when he visited us in February was that we now live in a new reality. Knowledge has become a free commodity. It's on every internet connected device. So the world simply no longer cares what you know because there's no competitive advantage to knowing more than the person sitting next to you. Now, aside, that is not to say that we can all try and go through life ignorant. You do still need to know things, but there's no inherent advantage anymore to having memorized more facts than the person right next to you. You can look something up and learn it just in time if you need it. So to go back to Dr. Wagner's statement, what the world really cares about now is what you can do with what you know. And that is a very different educational problem that we at Innovation Lab aim to be trying to solve. The implication is that it is more about the skills our students can demonstrate than the number of facts they can memorize. Four of those critical skills are what we call the four C's. Communication, bedrock to everything we do nowadays because information is so important and being able to communicate clearly that information is a huge, huge premium. Collaboration, the ability to work with others is is one of the most critical attributes that we can teach our students and real life collaboration, not the kind of things that they're used to in school where they get a get an assignment and they get into a group and everybody works in parallel to each other, but actually learning how to take a task, divide it up and hold each other mutually accountable for getting their parts done. Critical thinking. Never has in our history has there been more of an example of a time where critical thinking is absolutely necessary than what we are living through right now in our, in our lives and in our society. Being able to look at information, think critically about it, and discern whether the sources of that information are reliable or not. A year ago when I was giving my first informational talks about Innovation Lab High School. I remember having on the way to my very first talk, listening to NPR on the radio and hearing a person talking about how it is now possible for someone to capture enough of your voice from one of those phone calls that you get where there's nobody apparently on the other line to create a fake recording of your voice saying just about anything they want to. If that doesn't scare you, I don't know what does. The fact that people are now able to fake videos of people saying things they've never said makes puts a premium on our ability to think critically about the sources of information that we have. And finally, at the center where all of those things begin to overlap, we get the most human of all traits, creativity. Computers have figured out how to communicate in ways that are incredibly subtle. They can do more calculations per second than humans can at this point. They are, they are now being able to take over all sorts of jobs that we thought just a few years ago would always be safe from, from computers. But the one thing computers cannot do is that uniquely human trait of creativity. They simply cannot do that thing that, that we as humans can do. There are also some other things that are we've found to be very critical. One is a disposition toward innovation uh, that is incredibly important, and that is risk tolerance. Historically, schools are some of the most risk averse places on earth. I mean, think about it. 
what potential incentive is there for students to think outside the box if they risk not turning in something that meets what the teacher's expectations were. They risk getting a bad grade, they risk failure. And failure, as we all know, has been historically the worst thing that can happen in schools. And yet, innovation doesn't happen without failure. In fact, nowadays, modern companies talk all the time about failure, failing fast, failing cheap, failing safe, failing forward. But always they're now talking about failure because it's in our failures that we learn and we move forward. We tell students all the time that you learn more from your mistakes than you do from success. And then we punish their mistakes. It makes no sense. So what we are trying to do at Innovation Lab is build a culture that is far more risk tolerant, that teaches our students that their first draft, their first iteration is not necessarily going to be very good and to expect that. And then to take the feedback they get and improve their product. And then look for more feedback and take that feedback and improve their product. And then look for even more feedback and go through more and more and more cycles, which brings us to one of our favorite words, which is iteration. Moving from version 1.0 to 2.0, moving forward from 2.0 to 3.0, getting those cycles of feedback and moving your product forward through continuous cycles of improvement. So that leads us to yet another way that we are trying to branch out and, and bring in a little different style of learning, and that is the interdisciplinary approach. Judy Gilbert was at one point the head officer of talent uh, at Google Incorporated, and she said that if there's one thing educators must understand, it's the problems can no longer be solved nor even understood within the bright lines of academic disciplines. Innovation doesn't happen at the core of a discipline anymore. It happens at the edges, at the mesh points between those disciplines. It's where math meets social studies and looks at the statistics of some phenomenon that is going on. It's, it's where English meets art. It's where science meets physical education or where, uh, where computer technology meets any of the above. It's when we begin to look at the, the things that cross over between the disciplines that we begin to see the places where innovations can pop out. So what does this look like in the classroom? Well, we happen to have two of our teachers here with us this evening, and I figure we should ask them. I would like to introduce Mr. Kirby Morgan, who teaches both math and English at Innovation Lab, and Mr. Alec McTavish, who teaches both computer science and math. Alec, Kirby. What does this mean to you all in the classroom? There's not a good antecedent for this. Just going to point that out. Um, for for me, it's uh, I, I like what you said about it's it does us no good to have all this knowledge memorized into our heads. Um, I still think there's a lot of stuff that has to live outside of the computer, the, the device that you're looking things up on. And to me, that's all about the connections between things. You remember how things go together. You remember that this leads to this leads to this. And boom, you know where to look when you're digging online. So there is still a lot of we're not just offloading everything to the computers. There's a lot of what we need to do. But our power as humans has always been that connecting that connecting piece. And so I really love that Innovation Lab is doing that kind of, we're, we're, we're opening up the doors to all that kind of cross subject thinking and everything and giving our students more avenues to see, oh, this connects to this and I can come up with this cool idea. Thank you, Alec. Kirby, what about you? One of the big advantages of our school is also that we are such a small school and so one of the things that we're able to do is we're able to have lots of conversations amongst the staff about what we're doing. We're able to know what's happening in the other disciplines, and then we can look for those connections between them. And so 
we are continually looking for those ways that we can make connections between our classes. And many of the lessons and activities that we build in even make some of those connections. And we're starting to do some of that. We're certainly still building very much toward it. And we're learning along with many of our students, which is a fun experience to be learning along with our students. But we continue to make it more and more of that kind of interdisciplinary process. It really does focus on iteration and creativity. Uh, those are even things that I've explicitly talked through some of my classes this year, including in math class, teaching creativity and math, go figure, right? Uh, but these are the types of things that we're delving into where because we're at Innovation Lab, we can say we don't have to worry about racing through all of this book. Instead, we can take a step back at times and say, but we're going to go and focus on this skill as well and really think about how we think. Thank you so much. Appreciate the insight both of you brought tonight. So with that, I'm gonna move back to our, our presentation and continue on. So one of the things that we hear in education all the time is this idea that we need to somehow keep our students engaged in their learning. And engagement is great. Engagement, is means that the students are, are there, they're part of the process. But in my view, engagement is not enough. Engagement means getting students excited about our content and our interests and our curricula. And the problem is students aren't always excited about our stuff because it's not their stuff. I, I like to think of what we are doing at Innovation Lab and what our mission is, is not to be engaging our students, but to be empowering them. Empowering our students means giving them the knowledge and the skills to pursue their passions, their interests, and their future. When we cross that divide and we move from trying to engage our students to empowering them, we no longer have to try and supply that extrinsic motivation to get them interested in what's going on because now it's about their stuff. They're already interested. If they're passionate about it, they're going to keep going and they're going to they're going to keep learning until their passion and their interest has been piqued. If they're pursuing something that they see as part of their future, they're going to keep working on it and they're going to put their efforts into it because it means more to them. That's one of the big things about Innovation Lab is we are trying to figure out how to empower our students, not merely engage them. We also want to get our students operating as design thinkers. Throughout the last couple of months, we have been diving into the design thinking process teaching our students a way of looking at big, wicked problems. Things that are so complex, there's no easy solution to them. And trying to tease out how to figure out a way to address that problem. We have them empathizing with the, the people who may be suffering the problem, who are involved in it, for whom that, that uh, that that uh, solution they're trying to come up with is going to be targeted. We then have them defining the problem tightly and looking for the root causes of that problem because it does no good to treat the symptoms if you leave the root cause of the problem uh, un unchecked. They then engage in some brainstorming, trying to come up with ideas for solutions that match the root causes of those problems, moving into prototyping, and lastly, to testing their prototypes. Importantly here, the students are the ones defining the problems to be unraveled. Too often in schools, we hand students a problem and the student takes the problem from us and says, gee, thanks, what am I supposed to do with this? Our students have gotten to define the problems they are working on, and they are really tackling some meaty problems, doing some pretty amazing things. 
this leads us into some talk of our learning expeditions. An expedition is a long-term deep dive into a complex interdisciplinary problem. Our current expedition, the theme is pandemics as catalysts of innovation. Our students conducted some interviews in the community to build that sense of empathy and then used the information that they gathered from those those uh, those interviews to build a database of interview responses. And they used that database to go through and define problems that people see in the community. And they're currently engaged in designing prototype solutions to those very problems. So, at this point, I want to check in again with our students and our teachers, this time more focused on the work that we've been doing for the past couple of months now. We start at the beginning of November on our expedition. So students, I want you to describe the projects that you're working on for our current expedition and what has you excited about the project that you're working on. Then we're going to move over to the teachers and teachers, I'm going to want you to talk about what kind of skills our students have been learning as they've worked their ways through this expedition. With that, Kenna, you went second last time, so I'm going to ask you to talk first this time. Okay. Um, so with the expedition, um, the first thing I did was I looked over the database and I started reading through all the problems people had wrote up that um, based on their interviews. And one thing that stuck out to me a lot was that people aren't seeing their friends, people aren't going places. And um, I find myself, like, I think of myself as a really creative person. I have some really crazy, cool ideas. And so I thought about, um, like, some really cool, like, space suit, space bubble, like, hazmat suit kind of thing. And so I set up a little slide presentation, um, and I was able to present it to the whole school. And I was really happy to see that a whole bunch of people were interested in my idea. And so then I started leading my project and um, I started talking to some other people. And then we had some ideas about just creating it, some kind of helmet that people could wear and it has like some cool button on the side to release the front face shield so that people are able to eat. And um, currently we are working on a system for the filters um, some kind of mater material to make it out of. Um, we were talking about some kind of N95 material or something like that. I mean, they're really hard to get. So these are just some of the things that we're, we are thinking through. And there's a lot of research we have to do behind this. Um, so it's a really cool process. Um, it's so fun to collaborate with others and share ideas. And I just, I can't wait to see what our final product looks like because I've already started doing the drawing for a helmet and I'm really excited to present it. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Kenna. Izzy, how about you? Okay, yeah, so my group has been working on a plan for crews to meet at our school in person every week. I'm so excited about this plan because it's really been harder to socialize during online learning and you don't really get that personal connection you do in person. Uh, this project really gives me a chance to collaborate with my peers and make something that will fix a problem in online school. And our process was really that we researched everything that we needed to do, all the protocols that we needed to do to meet an online school, and like everything that needs to go down. We saw, we looked, and there, we have tents available for the crew meetups. And we were going to email Dr. Reed to try to get our permissions and try to see if she approves it. But yeah, it's just been really cool to try to put something in action and make something that might change. Thank you, Izzy. As you can see, folks, our students are coming up with some pretty awesome projects and looking at needs in their communities to start from when they're trying to come up with those projects. Now let's talk, pivot and talk to our teachers. Um, Kirby, you went second last time. So once again, I'll have you go first this time. Certainly. Uh, I and Alec both are uh, working with our technology group of expeditions. Uh, they're 
basically creating various software projects to meet various needs that they've observed that came up as a result of the pandemic. And when we talk about working in school and doing group projects, most of us have this vision in our head of four students sitting at a table with one or two students working and everybody else just kind of trying to go by on their coattails. And one of the neat things that we've been able to see is we've been starting to equip them with tools on how to actually uh, break down their work, where they're breaking down their big projects, where they're creating a software package, basically, into very small tasks, which then they can start claiming and giving them a process where they uh, move their tasks as they assign them between different categories. And so we can always see what everyone's doing. And it then gives us a way to help equip them with ways that they can actually work together more efficiently, but also ways to make sure that everybody is also participating in the group as well. And tools like that have been excellent about equipping them for real life collaboration types of skills. I'll let Alec follow up on that with other things he's been seeing in our group. Alec, you are uh, muted. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, so Kirby gave a pretty good discussion of what we're doing with the uh, with the task work. We're uh, pulling in just little pieces of what you'd have in the software world in terms of task boards. And uh, we did some good exercises pointing out that uh, multitasking is almost never what you want to do. And so teaching them to be able to break stuff down and say, look, you have one task. You're going to just work on that one task until it's done. And if you switch tasks, you're going to like split off what you completed over here and you're going to grab the next thing you're going to work on. You're not going to try and juggle two or three things at a time. And it's been good, uh, especially in these software projects, because some students are really interested in the idea they have no experience with software and watching as those groups figure out how to get everyone an active task and the fact that you have to have a task with your name attached to it. You can't just kind of sit on the edges and be ignored. So that's been pretty that's been pretty neat. And before, I, I would say, like in terms of skills learned, before we even got to this stage, all kinds of stuff, the way students had to sift through ideas and get them sorted out and then take an idea and dig down, why does this happen? Well, why does that happen? And why does that happen until they get down to a root cause? And this whole process um, with that and then what Kenna was talking about with presenting their ideas very uh kind of steam-like of just like, here's my project, anyone want to do it with me? And it either flies or it doesn't. And some of them flew and some of them didn't. And it was really neat. They're learning a lot of stuff there. One of the other things that we did, we've done over the course of this expedition was do a little bit of explicit learning about uh, leadership and work styles. Would either of you like to say just a word or two about that? Um, I'll talk to the mechanics just to the first. We did do a leadership style thing where students uh, did a quick survey that just kind of, you know, we have all these things that split you off into different groups. Um, what I liked about the survey was it didn't really give a name to each of those groups. It just gave them a color. And then we took all those students that had a particular color and we tossed them in a group together and they came to realize what it was that they shared in terms of their styles of leadership. And so they got to take some time to talk with each other and say, look, this is what kind of things I bring. These are the kind of ways I can leverage off other people's skills um, and a real focus on the positives of it as opposed to the, well, this is what I can't do well. It led to Thank some you. great conversations about how well they all complement each other too. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very well much. Said. One of the things that I love about our approach at Innovation Lab High School is we are looking for ways to focus on students' strengths rather than look at deficits and try and help students to put themselves in a position to best use their strengths at all times. Thank you all. We'll come back to you in just a little bit. But meanwhile, we are going to jump back into our presentation. So one of the things that we have adopted at Innovation Lab High School is a lot of the, the workings and philosophy of a model of education called expeditionary learning. Um, expeditionary learning has this idea that we have one vision for students that has three dimensions. 
This top one here, mastery of student knowledge and skills, is something that most, if not all schools, focus on to a, to a great extent, trying to help students expand their knowledge and expand their skills. However, when our students graduate and they leave our school, it may be the last time in their lives that they are measured by a test score. From that point forward, they will be measured by the quality of their work and the quality of their character. And so it is incumbent upon us as educators to attend to those things as much as we attend to the first, trying to help our students understand what it is and feel what it is to create beautiful, high quality pieces of work that are worthy of being in their portfolio and to help them understand who they are as people and attend to understanding what their priorities are, what their values are, and who they want to be as a person. In other words, attending to their character. One way that we do this is through the culture and structure that we call crew. Now, Expeditionary Learning grew out of a partnership between Outward Bound and Harvard Grad School of Education. Kurt Hahn, the founder of Outward Bound, had this quote, we are crew, not passengers, strengthened by acts of consequential service to others. That's where the name of crew comes from. Crew take an active hand in making sure the boat's getting where it needs to go. Passengers just sit back and go along and, and go wherever the boat goes, but crew are there helping to steer the ship. That's what we want out of each and every one of our students to be a member of the crew. As a culture, crew is the idea that we are all in this together, that we help each other out, that we team with each other, that we help each other get to the top of the mountain, because it does no good for me to get to the top of the mountain if I left my crew behind. That we as a group are together as a group and that we are there for each other. As a structure, crew is a place and a time for us to get stuff done. Crew meets daily um, in, when we are in person. And while we've been remote, it meets almost daily. The four days a week that we have classes, crew is one of our classes. It is a credit bearing class that our, each of our students takes. Each of our students is in a crew with peers their same grade. And we try and keep the crews as small as possible so that there is the, the smallest, most uh, easy to, to form a tight bond group that we possibly can. Every teacher in the school has a crew and every student in the school is a member of a crew. What this also means is that every student has a crew advisor in their teacher who is their go-to person whose job it is to get to know them, to advocate for them, to check up on them, to be that go-to person for families if something is starting to go wrong, and to be that liaison with the family if the school needs to, to ask questions. Furthermore, if we take it up a level, our staff, it begins at the staff level, our staff crew bonds together and attends to the needs of all staff to make sure that we, as the staff members, are ready to go out and serve our students. All together, it is the central thing that is the glue of, of Innovation Lab High School, both as a culture and as a structure. So, once again, let's, let's pause and talk to our panelists about how crew makes a difference for them. So students, I want to ask you, how has crew made a difference in your experience at Innovation Lab compared to any schools you've been in previously? And teachers, I'm going to ask you, how has the crew model made a difference for your ability to connect with students? All right. Izzy, you're up first this time. 
Okay, sounds good. Uh, you know, crew has really made a difference in my daily life at school. Uh, it's really given me a chance to get to know just a few of my classmates really well and just to have that crew advisor to support me in my classes and my learning. Um, and, you know, it's always my favorite part of the day. We can just kind of have fun, talk to each other, uh, learn with each other. And, you know, I really like my crew. They're a really fun bunch, but I'm really glad I like my crew because I am stuck with them for four years. Absolutely. Kenna. So I love my crew so much and mostly because I just feel supported and I feel like we're all in the same boat and we have some really great topic discussions um, when we're in crew and I just, I really feel empowered by everyone and I love everything we talk about. Um, I just, it's really special to have that bond, that really close knit bond with a couple people. And I mean, like right in the beginning of the school year, we were already so close and we set up a group chat and we just FaceTimed so much and we just got really close all of a sudden. And I just, have loved having that group of people. And I, if I know that I'm not feeling good, I have those people to go to. And if I need academic support or I have a question, just text them and we'll answer. And I just, it just feels so good to have that fun group of people. And I know that I'm gonna have them for a couple more years now. And, and I'm gonna be really sad when I have to leave them in senior year, so. And I just have to say, Kenna has the extreme misfortune to be in my crew. Yeah. So the poor thing has to put up with having the principal as her crew advisor every single day. She's got to look at this. So, you know, and despite that, look at the kind of smile she always has on her face. So, um, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave that as, as is. Alec, how, how does crew give you opportunities in this school? Uh, at first, I'd say like I um, I'm happy with what it's doing this year. I think it will be so much more once we're back in person. I think there's there will be uh, a, an even better level of connection than we have now. But yes, having that one small group where there's no where there's nothing on the table except getting to know each other and and supporting each other through the stresses is good. Uh, I liked the way that we were able in the first three weeks of school to have that crew framework to really build up that community before we dug into uh, curriculum. So um, it's the beginning of a journey. I think I think my students are making good connections. I think they'll make better connections um, as we go on through the years and as we are able to meet in person. Kirby, how about you? I definitely agree. Um, I think uh, one way to kind of describe it is in contrast to what is done in a lot of schools, which is some sort of advisory, which goes by so many different so many different names like Cougar Time and things like that. Uh, but there are different forms of advisory where basically they kind of feel like uh, train stations of activity where students are coming and going for different purposes. And it's one central place, but you don't necessarily get time to just sit down and really get to know the students. Crew is a place where they stay with us during that time. We really get a chance to sit down and get to know our students and they get to know each other through that time. And so it's a very powerful way to actually have a chance to invest in them without having to worry about getting through this or that in that time. It's all about getting to know each other. And it's provided a lot of great opportunities for us to have a lot of fun together. Yes, we actually play games uh, often once a week. We'll play games in crew but also times when we can discuss issues of the day and other soft skills that have been coming up. And so it's been a great way for us to really just improve as people, but also to make those personal connections. How about the social emotional learning that we've been doing through crew? Any of you want to speak to the, the kind of social emotional growth that we've been trying to achieve as a, as a school through our crew? Uh, I will say in my crew, we always do uh, some sort of like meditation or de-stress video at least once a week. 
where we all just kind of sit down and we can turn our cameras off if we don't feel comfortable, but we just sit down and try to like de-stress and just have that time. Thank you, Izzy. Anybody else? I mean, for my crew, we do do a lot of time where we talk about like things that are stressing us or things that are emotional about, and we can give each other support and feedback. And yeah, we've had lots of good conversations like that. Thank you. One last thing I do want to point out, and Izzy, I want to give you the floor to talk about crew council and and your Izzy was instrumental in in the development of that aspect of our school. Yeah, so um, I not only participate in crew council, but I helped found it along with two of my classmates. Uh, we met together because we had an idea that we wanted the students to lead our weekly all school meetings. It ended up working out. We met with Principal Shirky. He was on board and now we meet once a week and it consists of one person from every crew, but it's open to anyone who has an idea or something they wanna say in the all school meeting. And it's really been a place for like students to take charge and try to plan something for the whole school and get stuff done for the school. Thank you. They've been doing a really good, they've been doing a really good job of it. Those meetings have been great. Thank you. So, Thank you all for, for your sharing. Um, I am going to head back to our presentation and we will, I think we're into the home stretch now. So one of the things that is a characteristic of our school is we are trying to help build in our students an ethic of service. As we've mentioned before, our expeditions are focused on a some sort of a deep project that benefits the community around them. Often they're having they're finding a social or environmental justice theme in what they are doing. And our students are the ones who are defining the problems that they see in their community and then pro proposing the solutions. And lastly, just to touch one more time, bringing in that I that crew uh, ethic that community success is more important than individual success. Another thing that we are starting to embark upon is the idea that our students are going to be maintaining portfolios of their work. They're gonna be looking for work that shows their highest levels of mastery. They're gonna be looking to, to have artifacts in their portfolio that excuse me, demonstrate their growth over time. They may choose to put artifacts in their portfolio that show a way in which they have overcome a particular challenge. And the thing that we are really proud about is we are figuring out how to make these portfolios digital because that will come in very importantly in just a few slides. Another thing that is, is coming up a little faster for our 10th graders is the idea of passages. There are many, many, many rites of passage that, that we all go through as we grow up. Uh, and schools have their own sets of rites of passage. There are things at many schools that are social rites of passage. There are many things that are athletic rites of passage. And there are many things that are academic rites of passage. One of the most powerful academic rites of passage is the passage presentation at the end of 10th grade. Our students will use their portfolio of artifacts to demonstrate that they are ready to be promoted to 11th grade. To be able to stand up and say, here I am, here is my work, and here is how I know that I am ready to be promoted to the next grade, is to put the students in the driver's seat of their own learning to make sure that they are self-aware enough to be able to talk about the highs as well as the lows, where they, have where they have achieved excellence and where they still have growth to make and what their plans are going into the, their 11th and 12th grade years to make sure that they are on track to graduate 
as a, a member of the Innovation Lab High School community. Again, at the end of 12th grade, students will be given the opportunity to reflect publicly on their academic journey. It's a, a passage that, uh, that we, we have yet to name, but several schools who, who do this often call it the parting shot or the, uh, the final word. The opportunity for our students when they reach the end of their 12th grade year to pass on their wisdom to the younger students in the school. Again, an opportunity for students to be highly reflective about their own learning. We are placing a focus on learning and skills, not on grades. One of the reasons why, when you read research about grades, grades reward compliance. They rarely reward creativity. Even when we hand students a rubric for how they will be graded, we have already constrained what it is we expect to see from them, and it quelches the creativity that they otherwise might have if they have a far more open box. We're examining the practices that promote and reward learning and trying to accentuate those and help our students to, to discover a joy of learning for learning's sake and to put the focus on the skills they are, are learning to master and the quality of the products they are creating. One of the ways that we are tracking this, we have entered a partnership with an organization called the Mastery Transcript Consortium. They have developed a new 21st century transcript that we will be using at Innovation Lab High School. This transcript focuses on skills mastered rather than seat time and grades, and it is preferred by admissions officers at all levels of colleges and universities, from the Ivy League to NCAA institutions to smaller private liberal arts schools. Just as a couple of examples here, uh, a admissions officer from Caltech says, I care deeply about the collaborative spirit that we can't get from grades and GPA. We need a better understanding of how kids work with peers, better, uh, better for example, that's beneficial for the selection process. Another admissions officer from Colorado College talks about the, the lack of authentic voice in a traditional application and, and transcript and the ways in which the mastery transcript gives them a deeper sense of student abilities and potential. An admission officer from Princeton talks about how they, they think the mastery transcript is great and allows them to understand students' stories in a deeper way. So what does it look like? Well, this is what the transcript looks like. The student is able to place a, a statement of their own writing up here to introduce themselves. And then we end up with a credit profile, the look of which is roughly the same for every school. Each school gets to de determine each of these big buckets of skills and the individual subskills within each of their buckets. But overall, the look of it remains the same. Each of these lines you see here is a skill that the student has mastered. Those skills are listed out below the graphic down here individually, so that you can see here under social and emotional acuity, the student has mastered understanding of self, understanding of others, mind-body balance, and self-directed learning as foundational credits, these less bold lines. And then the more bold line is an advanced skill, leadership in learning. The foundational skills are skills that every student is expected to master with the thicker advanced credits being advanced skills that the student has chosen to focus on. I would also like to call your attention to this right column over here that says evidence. In the mastery transcript, these are live links to the student's digital portfolio. A 
a college admissions officer could click on this link to bioengineering and pull up the paper that Kavita has written that shows mastery of the advanced skill technical design. Or they could come down here and open up the, the link to volunteering for Cake for Kids and see the, her description of the public service she has done in her volunteer work for this nonprofit organization. It allows the admissions officer with a single click to see the work of the student in a way that a traditional transcript could never communicate. Now, a couple of things that you do not see and will not see on the mastery transcript. There are no grades and there is no GPA. And college admissions officers are okay with that. There's also no test score from SAT or ACT on here. Now, there wouldn't be on a traditional transcript either. Those are always sent separately. But this is about the skills the student has demonstrated they have mastered and the evidence to support that mastery on the transcript. The one thing you cannot see from this view is at the bottom of the transcript is a list of all the courses that the student has completed because colleges do want to see that as well. But because I was only able to grab a still, I'm not able to, to scroll all the way down to show that. So that is also a part, an important part of the mastery transcript. Now, lastly, a really cool thing happened last year while we were uh, in the planning year for Innovation Lab High School, the State Board of Education made an opportunity available to apply for a waiver from the credit hours graduation requirement. I wrote an application and that application was accepted and a waiver was granted. Normally that doesn't mean a whole lot to anybody, but to us that is absolutely critical because what that waiver does is allow us to make full use of the mastery transcript and to go all in placing the focus on skills mastered rather than the amount of time students have spent in a seat. This has a couple of corollaries. This means that a student can bring in evidence of mastery of a skill from anywhere and submit it as evidence that they have mastered a skill and we can consider that evidence. That is huge for our students because it means it makes the world their classroom. So this is a huge part of what we are doing and a huge part of what we think is going to make Innovation Lab incredibly successful. We have a transcript that, that college admissions officers say they prefer and that we think is going to give our students a competitive advantage when they're applying for college. Um, it also is just an incredible way to put the focus on what our students need to do to learn the skills that the world actually wants from them. So this is, all of these things have come together in just this amazing way that we have luckily have been able to bring all of these things together. There are lots of places across the country that are uh, using the four C's. There are lots of places that are talking about using the mastery transcript. There are lots of places that are here in the state that have waivers from the State Board of Education. We are the only place we know of that is bringing all of these parts together in one place. And we think it's resulting in something really special. Last thing before I move on from mastery transcript, it went live for the first time this past uh, winter in the, the winter of 2019, 2020. And students were using it live for admissions for the first time last year. The Mastery Transcript Consortium reports that every single student, 100% of them that used the transcript, got into at least one college or university of their choice. And that there was not one single report of a college or university rejecting the transcript. So it has gained acceptance already and we think that it's going to be a part of what sets our students apart. So to wrap up, 
Innovation Lab High School is an ever-evolving school. It began grounded somewhat in the familiar, and we have had some early changes. As Izzy reported, um, students came to me with the idea for the crew council, and we, we ran with it. We have made a couple of curricular changes that we have uh, that we made in response to some needs from our students. We're growing, we're changing, we're refining practices as we go. We're making some mistakes and we're learning from them and celebrating them as opportunities because, as I talked about earlier, we are trying to develop a risk tolerant culture. That's it for the talking here. I thought we would end with a few photos of our brand spanking new building that is just waiting for it to be safe for us to occupy it. This is a picture of our cafeteria. All the tables are, are kind of folded up along the side here and the chairs are stacked nicely. But we do have some uh, standing height tables here under these nice little pedestal lamps to kind of give a little bit of a bistro seating flair to some of the, the seating. A, a bunch of the other seating is uh, normal chair height tables. And then we have this long counter along the edge there. Gives a lot of different choices for students to what kind of uh, what kind of seating they want to use in our cafeteria. Uh, one of the things I was absolutely adamant about, the very first decision I made was in saying we had to have bottle fillers. So every floor, there's a bottle filler. So for those of you who are planning on coming to Innovation Lab High School in the fall, um, make sure you have a water bottle so that you can make use of the bottle fillers and we can save as many plastic bottles from going into the landfill as possible. They also have, each one has a counter on it. So we may be able to start setting up, you know, competitions by floor for which floor has the most, uh, has the most bottles filled in a given time. You know, fun things like that, trying to be environmentally conscious. We have a number of different styles of furniture available in the school. One of them are these, these uh, individual little student tables that can be moved around and reconfigured in a number of different settings. Um, they can be pushed together to make larger work surfaces, etc. cetera. Um, half of them are concave and the other half are convex so that they actually fit together in, in interesting, neat patterns. Um, we also very intentionally, you'll notice that this, this closest table here is actually a standing height table with, with taller stools because one of the things I wanted to make sure we provided was that every classroom learning space has some, some variable height seating so that students who need to be able to stand during, during class have the option to use one of those tables and, and you know, can, can move a little bit as needed because for some students that ability to just you know, move their, their tall stool back and stand instead is a very important way of keeping themselves focused. Our, our building has tons of these little breakout rooms available where students can, can peel off and go have a smaller meeting with their group and have a, a space in which they can, can talk and, and conduct their business without having to have the, the chaos of having several groups within a classroom at the same time. So that's one of the neat features of our building is we have so much collaborative space. And then I wanted to share a, a post that one of our parents saw from one of our students on their Instagram account last night. Um, this was posted by one of our students. If you are an incoming freshman or a future sophomore, apply. I absolutely love this school. We get to work on student-led projects that have a positive impact on the community while also having regular classes. Right now, I'm a part of the group that's creating a mental health outreach program that includes flyers set out to everyone in NSD, a website, resources like school counselors and therapists, and a hotline. People at this school are seriously amazing. And come on, the walls are literally movable whiteboards. And just to make sure I can prove it, back here in the back, those, those panels you see here are on a track and can be moved back and forth. And every single one of them is a floor to ceiling whiteboard that our students can, teachers can use in the course of their learning. So that's it. Um, if you have questions after the, the, uh, the webinar tonight that aren't answered, please feel free to give me a call or uh, to drop me an email. My email is right there, pshirky at nsd.org. 
My, my office line phone number is right there. And I welcome any calls or questions or emails. I'm happy to answer them from you. And now I am going to toss back to our hosts, Kenna and Izzy. And let you take it from here. Okay, thank you. Wait, we can't hear you, Izzy. Hello? A uh, little better. Okay. Just speak thank up a little bit. There you okay. go. Uh, thank you, Principal Shirky, for that information. Uh, at this time, you can use the Q&A feature to submit questions. Please make sure to include the name of the person you're directing the question to. And you'll see the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And I'll bring in uh, our two teachers, Alec and Kirby, to uh, answer questions as well. So, Izzy, Kenna, as soon as you're ready, uh, go ahead and start firing some questions away at us. And we would also point out that if you see a question already in the Q&A that is similar to one you would be wanting to, uh, to ask, you can upvote it to uh, make it rise up to the top. One, one question that I'm seeing upvoted a lot, uh, it's, uh, are there any requirements to apply? And I'm guessing this is for Mr. Shirky. Yes, the student has to currently be in eighth grade and ready to go into ninth grade next year. That's it. Um, I have a good question. Um, are students able to participate in sports? Are students able to participate in sports? Fantastic question. As a very, very small school, Innovation Lab is not going to be fielding any varsity sports teams. Instead, our students can participate for their home area high school. So if you happen to live in the North Creek attendance area, you would participate in sports for North Creek High School. If you live in the Bothell area, you would participate with Bothell sports teams. And all of the logistics of that are worked out and we have students who are signed up and ready to go to, um, to participate in sports when COVID allows. I will also throw in that we are currently in the founding phases of starting an esports team as well for the school, which may eventually end up actually being a varsity sports as well. Esports is in the process of being qualified as a sport on par with the other sports that are commonly found at the high schools. But we are working on that team as well right now. Okay, I see another one. It's been uploaded a lot. Uh, to Peter, what courses slash classes are you currently offering? So because we started very small with just ninth and 10th grade, um, our course offerings this year were fairly limited. Um, we have the, the math courses you would generally expect. We have English, we have history, uh, we have we have all of our ninth and tenth graders this year taking physics, and physics will be our default um, ninth grade class in the future. Um, we're currently talking about whether there may be possibly other options or not. That's still kind of in the works. Um, next year, our tenth and eleventh graders will go on and take chemistry, um, and then in uh, the 11th grade course after that will become biology. So that they're going in the order of physics, then chemistry, then biology. I'm a former science teacher and trust me when I tell you that is the order they should be studied in because physics is the most fundamental. Chemistry builds on physics, biology builds on chemistry. And if you learn them in that order, they all make more sense. Um, in terms of electives, uh, we have a couple of different languages. We offer Spanish and American Sign Language. We, uh, and we have a couple of elective options this year. We were offering an art class and Alec is teaching an awesome computer science course. Um, and that was, you know, we also had PE and health for our ninth graders because we wanna make sure that, that they get that, uh, that taken care of. Uh, next year we will have 
far more elective options than we had this year because we will have far more students taking electives. Um, in most high schools, the ninth grade year is pretty prescribed, getting a lot of those requirements out of the way. And then more and more and more elective options open up as you get into 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. Since most of our students this year are ninth graders, we only had a handful of 10th graders to take electives. So we had very few. Next year, we will have more. And that's going to be part of talking to our students about what are the electives they want to take. Um, I got a question about how is my experience um, innovation lab different than um, my regular high school? Um, so I think that the experience is totally different, actually. Um, I really felt like I was just, I just had a simple schedule and I was walking class to class and I was getting graded on how long I was sitting in a class and if I got the right answer. And it was just pretty straightforward. And I felt like, you know, any typical high school is going to be for the student who is just okay checking the box and says, okay, I go to this class, I do this, I'm going to get the A and everything's going to be great. And it just, it wasn't a very personal experience. And I don't know, I also struggled being at a big school like that because I was confused a lot about how things worked and um, who to talk to when I needed something. And so at Innovation Lab, it's a lot more personal and I'm able to have the help I need. And it's just a whole lot better. So, yeah. One of the things I said a long time ago is you're never going to hear me badmouth another school. Our comprehensive high schools in the North Shore School District are all four of them amazing. They are fantastic comprehensive high schools and students are not going to go wrong at any of them. Many of our students just need the speedboat. That the, the aircraft carrier wasn't quite the right fit for them but boy, the speedboat is. And some, some of our students are looking for something different. Some of our students would be absolutely fantastic in either school, but they've chosen to come with us. And so you're not going to hear us badmouth um, any of our high schools because they're all fantastic. We're just different. Not going to claim we're better. We're just different. Okay. Well, I might try and claim we're better. No, I'm not. I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little biased. I, I, I really like the school that we're at, but, uh, but I'm not going to badmouth any of our, our high schools. They're fantastic. There was another question. Uh, are there AP classes available? So that's, that's been a, that's been sort of a, a, a thing that we've gone around on. So Last year, I was imprecise in my language. I'm a little more precise this year. In the, in the expeditionary learning model, there are a number of established schools um, who during the, the, the pre-COVID era, um, for many of their upper division classes, their 11th and 12th graders, who had been in the model for a few years, um, those students even though the schools only offered maybe a couple of AP classes that were officially designated as AP classes, students in some of those junior, senior level classes felt prepared enough by the depth of learning that they had become accustomed to that they would go out and take the AP test anyway, even though the course they was, were taking was not officially an AP course. And in those schools, established schools, teaching in an in-person model, junior, senior students used to the model and the depth of learning. Um, those students at those schools tended to perform as well as or better than their peer institutions in their districts. Um, there's a lot of ifs, ands, and provisos there, <laughs> right? Um, this year, we experienced a number of students wanting to sign up for AP classes um, and you know, the whole world is different this year. Um, and with online learning and everything else, there's a new reality to trying to prepare students for uh, AP classes. So we are 
going through that the very best we can to support students who want to take AP tests. Um, at this point, I would go back to pointing out that in, in the schools that have used this model, predominantly the students who have attempted to challenge AP tests have been juniors and seniors who are used to the model and become accustomed to the depth of learning um, in that model. Um, so, you know, that, that is something to, to take into account. Um, as we move on, we may look at some AP offerings. Um, we may not. That is a decision to be made as we are continuing to, to evolve as a school. But at this time, um, we have exactly one AP class. We have an AP environmental science class right now this year. Okay, perfect. Um, there was one other question. Uh, how large is your crew? And for me, my crew is around 14 people. We just got another teacher, but 14 people. Um, and I believe the maximum amount of people in one crew is 17. And we have 10 crews total. Yeah, so my crew, I think it's about 12 people. Um, yeah, it's a pretty small group, which I think is really great. Okay. And uh, what if someone applies then changes their mind? We did have a few people apply uh, last year and then change their mind. There is always a right of return to the home area high school. Uh, one of the things that we have asked people to be thoughtful about is that school changes are less than ideal for students. Um, and so, especially mid-year. So we would be asking that once the school year starts, we're asking students and families to commit to at least one full year. And if at the end of that, that one full year, you've tried it out and it's not for you and you want to go back to your home area high school, you always have that right. Um, we just ask students and families to, to make that commitment for a full year and, and make sure that you are committed to that full year. Okay. Okay. There's one other, there's another question too. Uh, can we have a music program at our school? Can we have a music program? I would love to have a music program. Um, as I mentioned before, I am a musician. I was a sousaphone player in the, in the marching band. Um, and we have a building that does not lend itself to large musical ensembles. And we, are, we don't have a place that we could have a large orchestra or a concert band um, to rehearse without creating so much noise that they would make learning untenable for other classroom areas in the building. Could we come up with a creative way to have smaller groups? Well, that would be innovation. And that's kind of what we, we do. If we have enough students who want to try and come up with a, a way to do music, then we will definitely look at trying to figure out a way to make it happen. I just need to make sure that everybody has eyes wide open that we are not likely going to have a concert band or a concert orchestra that we just simply do not have the facilities for those things. Um, there was another question that I'm actually interested in and it is a uh, dress code. So when we go back to school, will there be a dress code? I will have to look at um, if the district has a district dress code, um, then we, we will kind of go from there. Um, I just generally my take on it has always been that students should have enough sense to dress for what it is they want to do. And you're dressing for school, not for the club. You're dressing for uh, success. And people often say that you dress for the job you want. Well, 
you know, that's kind of the, the sort of ethic we want to build in our students that you want to be dressing in a way that communicates what that you are a serious person. Um, that said, I don't enjoy being the clothing police. So <laughs> I'd prefer not to, to have to have those conversations. And so we will ask our students to be thoughtful about what it is they are wearing. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Another good one that I found is would you have a school bus uh, transportation? Yes, we will have bus transportation. Uh, the transportation office is still trying to figure out how that will work, but the idea would be that in the morning, students would ride the bus to their home area high school and then catch a shuttle over to Innovation Lab. And then the afternoon part is the part that the, uh, the transportation department is still trying to figure out, but then that it would get students back to home after school. And that's for them to figure out, not for me, because my job's principal, not dispatcher. Uh, so it is 729 and we are, uh, we are at the end of our webinar. There are a number of other questions that we can see here in the, uh, in the Q and A. We will try and figure out a way to, uh, to grab those and get some of those answers to those out onto our website. For those of you who submitted questions that we have not yet gotten a chance to answer. Um, I do see one in there. What are the odds of getting into ninth grade? Um, we have a total capacity of 600 students. So if you divide that by four grades, that's about 150 per grade. Um, as of this evening, as I was logging on, we already had somewhere in the neighborhood of 90 applications. So the, there is quite a bit of interest and space is limited. So um, if you are interested, by all means apply and we will see where the, uh, the, the road takes us. All right, thank you everybody. We appreciate your, your time joining us. And uh, remember that there will be a copy of this posted to our website um, so that people who weren't able to view can see it. So if you know someone who wasn't able to join us tonight but could be interested, make sure to let them know that they can come see tonight's webinar on our website. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Have a great evening. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for coming.